busy day, busy day, busy day. You're trying to do all of the things and you're trying to do them all perfectly. And in fact, it's part of your identity. I don't mean home chores and schooling the kids and going to work and all of those things. And a lot of us are trying to do all that. It's this other part of us, part of our Unitarian Universalist identity, the part where we say we accept the inherent worth and dignity of every person and love is my religion and love is the doctrine of our faith. And then we try to do all the loving ourselves. We try to do all of the active loving ourselves. And in fact, sometimes we hold each other to that idea that at every moment of every day, you are supposed to be acting 100% loving and everything you do is supposed to be a complete and perfect show of love. That doesn't work and we're failing at it. I mean, kids, you know this, right? If I told you you had to be nice and kind and sweet at every single moment and couldn't be angry or grumpy and could never be selfish, that would be kind of miserable, right? Well, I wanna talk about that today. And me and McSabby and Miss Amy are gonna talk a little bit about what that feels like when one, we know we're supposed to love everyone, but two, there's a lot of people in the world and we get tired. So how do we call our uni selves Unitarian Universalists? How do we think about universal salvation and love and divinity of everything if we're also going to say that maybe we don't have the time or energy to take care of everything? I will tell you that next week, Rev. Christine is going to get into it about John Murray and universalism. So you'll get some context there too and get some even deeper thoughts. But today I wanna to think about that part where you say, I'm a Unitarian Universalist and put a sign up that says love is my religion or says we lead with love. So we're all sacred and divine and worthy. And that means everyone deserves care. But if you're that homemaker on the treadmill trying to care for everyone, you're gonna be frazzled you're going to be exhausted and you're going to be desperate, be it for that jello packet or for something to help. And what we don't want to do is make an excuse to not love everyone. What we want is figuring out how to do that in a way that makes sense. So first it starts with figuring out who your people are. That baby floating in the air in that cartoon, who's that baby for you? Who's the person you're making dinner for? Who is the group of people you've pulled around you? I always jokingly call it my 12. Who are the 12 people you are capable of taking care of right now and who are taking care of you? And then the other part is making sure that you're taking care of yourself. Remembering that protect your people includes yourself. And that poor homemaker, no one was protecting her except for the Jello advertisement voiceover guy, which is concerning, right? No wonder we lean on capitalism. Recently, I've seen a whole bunch of Unitarians struggle with an identity crisis via Facebook. And it was exactly that conflict of loving everyone and giving love and care and kindness to everyone and other feelings that we have as people. You see, no one deserves to get horribly sick, especially not in the time of pandemic. But when the president got sick, I saw and heard a lot of folks struggling with how they should feel about that and what they had the right to say. And that's a pretty big one, right? What does lo loving kindness look like when we truly extend it all the way out? Do we expend ourselves? These are things we wanna talk about today and we want you to think about today. I want you to remember, I am the housekeeper in that video and I am a universalist. And then I also want you to remember, I am not that housekeeper and I don't have to be that kind of universalist. Carry those two things as you listen and watch today. Inherent worth and dignity still means someone has to wash the dishes. We have to make sure that when we're doing that, we're keeping our network strong and ourselves strong, okay? So are you ready for service today? Two things before we start, one, is a bit of a content warning. We are gonna talk about sexual assault. Won't be terribly graphic, but we will mention it. So if that's a sensitive issue for you, know that when Abby begins speaking her second part, that she'll be mentioning it a little bit. And then the other part, 
you might need a paper and pencil for today. Um, you could go get it now. I'll wait. Okay, I'm not actually that patient. I hope you have a pencil and paper nearby. Things to look out for in today's service. Count the number of times that we mention the ocean. Sunshine, catch a lyric from Prince. Everyone else might catch it too, but I'm fairly certain Miss Sunshine will. Notice the mention of VAWA, the Violence Against Women's Act. Hear Blanche, Dorothy, Rose, and Sophia get a call out. Listen to some words from a very revered Mr. Adams. Douglas Adams, that is. See if anyone talks about pizza. And cheer for Abby as she attempts the tongue twister that is passionate about particulate count. Passionate about particulate count. I'm so happy you're here with us today. Let's get on with it. My girlfriend was going to leave me if I did not put my father away in prison. He's gonna hurt more kids if you don't put him away, and I can't stay around for that. You're the one who has the power to make this happen. Nobody else can do it. This was not what I wanted to hear. I didn't want to hear anything. I think I was trying to lose myself watching Golden Girls DVDs while she was talking. I was pretty overwhelmed because a few days earlier, I'd had a sit-down conversation with my abusive father, moderated by Chris, my childhood DRE. I had just wanted to ask him questions about what he'd done, what had happened. I wanted to know details because worse than knowing was not knowing and imagining what might be true. I wanted to know the size and shape of the monster under my bed, and now I did. My girlfriend at the time had been raised Baptist. The full-on hellfire, two hours of hard bench sitting, women can't preach kind of Baptist. She believed in knowable right and wrong, in sin and salvation. I felt wishy-washy and numb, but also like maybe she was right, but putting someone in prison was really far outside of what I could see myself doing. In your wildest dreams, what do you want to happen? That was where Reverend Kim started, and I'd never started from that place. Nobody taught me to start from my dreams. I'd spent my life hating those sorts of songs. As an adult, I attend Arlington Street Church in Boston, so I'd reach out to Reverend Kim Crawford Harvey for help figuring out what I should do. This was our first pastoral phone call. I couldn't think of anything I wanted, so Reverend Kim made a suggestion. What if every year for the rest of his life, he had to produce a hand illuminated, gold encrusted, quill ink copy of Father Daughter Incest by Judy Herman? How would that feel? I sat with that, thought about how that could eat up so much of his energy and creativity. I imagined him as a medieval monk in a scratchy brown robe, hunched over a desk, flecks of gold leaf everywhere. How much it would speed up his arthritis in his hands. It was satisfying, but it wasn't right. I want to make it so he can't be in a position to hurt any more people. That's what I keep coming back to. I don't know how to do that. I want him to have somebody else being responsible for him since he can't be responsible for himself. We were both quiet. I asked, aren't prisons supposed to be for abolishing? It's what I'd heard a million times. My mother's entire career had been chipping away at the prison system through data. She helped set state policy to expand nonviolent prison release programs in New Jersey, and in the summer, she would preach at our UU church about the political ineffectualness of tough on crime, starting in the 80s, how punishment didn't reduce crime or make us safer. At budget time, she went in front of the state legislature to show the drop in recidivism, the financial benefits to the state, and got her program expanded many times. He would be so lucky to go to prison, Reverend Kim said, instant karma. I researched sex offender prison in New Jersey. There's a special program at Rahway State that was the only special program for sex offenders in the country from 1976 to 1994. Anyone who was ever part of the program can attend outpatient groups at no cost for the rest of their life. I wrote to a journalist who wrote a piece about it 10 years ago. Did she think that it was a place that people actually got help? How can I put another person in prison if we all have inherent worth and dignity? I asked but it wasn't the right question. You don't need to worry about his inherent worth and dignity, Reverend Kim said. Let that be someone else's department. The grubby final shade of my ego was pulled and it jerked up with a whisking sound and a tight snap, the handled edge whipping around the center core a few times. The light was brighter, edges came into focus and colors were sweeter in my eyes. Of course, Universalists believed that everyone was saved, is saved. Is saved even the right word? 
but they also believed in an all-powerful God who was the heart of love. That was who was doing the universal loving and saving, not me. And that here, as humans, we can aim for that love, but none of us can hold every person in supreme divine love truly in our tenderest hearts. We're not some all-powerful divine heart of love. That was never supposed to be something we were going to actually achieve. Part of me was trying to earn my A+, but what kind of spiritual cosmic report cards would a universalist even get? I went forward with my case. I thought of how exhausting it would be to feel that a monster lives in you, how it might be relaxing to feel that your monster is in a place where it can't hurt everybody. My case went forward in Middlesex County, New Jersey, which is home to the wildly progressive criminology department of Rutgers University, and which used VAWA, Violence Against Women Act, funding to create a freestanding center to house everything that a victim of a violent crime would need to report the crime against them, to get a variety of services, and to feel that they were somewhere safe and friendly while they did so. The sex crime unit is not in the police station. There are separate and age-appropriate waiting rooms for adult and child victims. At every stage of my case where I needed to make a decision, my detectives were generous and warm. And I need to tell you, because I know the men you were picturing in your head, neither of them was white. As a matter of policy, they told me when I had reached a decision point what it would look like to move forward and what would be true if I left and ended the process. I was allowed to take my time to go away and come back. I was allowed to order delivery of amazing New Jersey pizza while I made my decisions. Worrying about his inherent worth and dignity wasn't my department. What department is mine? Who are your people? If you try to do a meta meditation after you picture the people you love, or a bank teller who is friendly, you can try to picture Pol Pot or Hitler, or even the person who interrupts you in chalice circle all the time to make unfunny jokes and then she laughs at them. I don't even try extending metta to my dad. He's out of my circle. Years ago, in a healing ritual that I participated in, an older woman shook a turtle shell over my heart. I saw him clearly in detail like he was right there. I got really mad. How dare he be in this healing circle? Then suddenly he was gone from my heart. I think about him sometimes, but I don't feel for him. He's not a wave I bump into. We are both water, waves in the same sea, it's true, but I found a home in a very different part of that sea. From what I've heard third hand, his world is kind of small now. I think he's stuck in a little eddy, in a little eddy that just swirls around in a circle. Maybe it's cozy there, maybe he feels safe. May we all have well-being. May his well-being be far away from mine. We are both waves in the same sea, but so is every single other person. Since I can't literally love every single person, like Amy said, I don't have to hold him in my heart. Maybe Miss Hilarious Interrupter in Chalice Circle will hold him in her heart instead. Love may be the doctrine of our congregation and of your faith. And we may be called to build a world from love and work together and push forward in love, but honoring each person, each and every person's inherent worth and dignity, reaching out to marginalized communities and being physically present in them does not mean that you are the best candidate for every job. Our Unitarian Universalist values do not ask you to be the smartest, prettiest, most perfect person in the room. In fact, you never can be. And when you think you are, you're probably wrong. Our Unitarian Universalist values do not ask you to share the same rhythm and flow with every other person on the planet, to create solutions for problems you see in other people's communities, or to completely expend yourself in service of others. You don't have to be nice to everyone. Kindness and gentleness, yes but don't fake it. Don't ignore the jello packet, the instant jello pudding sitting on the cupboard. See the resources around you, see the resources and strengths that other people in other communities can access. It doesn't have to all come from you. You do not have to teach, convince, or model perfect love for the whole world. And in fact, you can't. I know it's hard to hear that, but we aren't perfectly skilled and we may know love and we may practice it and we may work hard towards it, but we're not 
the perfect candidate for every job. No individual person should be the caretaker of the whole world. None of us on our own know how best to do that. And you don't have to. You don't have to be cool to rule the world. You don't have to tend to every drop of water in the ocean. You wouldn't be very good at it, no matter how much love and learning you put into it. You do have to participate in the care of the ocean. You do have to be curious about the rest of the ocean. You don't have to go across the world to build water filtration systems when local teenage girls are already selling filtered water for school fees. You do have to support systems that care for everyone. You do have to elect mining commissioners who are passionate about particulate count so you don't have to be. You do have to push for prison reform. You do have to support the careers of politicians who see the ocean and are committed to service. You do have to mentor and be mentored. You do have to create redundancies, make sure someone else knows how to mop the floor just as well as you do, so that on the day you are too tired, the floor gets mopped. You do have to understand the policies that shape our communities. Do all the things to make sure that you aren't just keep taking care of your people. Do the things that make space in the world for everyone to be loved, and fiercely, actively, directly love the community that surrounds you.